Hello everyone, my name is Hannah Watson and I'll be giving you an overview of graphene-based integrated photonics for optical interconnect and present research that I've been involved with at the Cambridge Graphene Centre where I'm currently finishing my PhD. So this is a special presentation for me because before starting the PhD I was actually working at ARM so it feels very nice to be able to show what I've been working on since then. So firstly, I will describe a generic optical link and explain the different components and then give some examples of current implementations of optical interconnect for both long and short distance applications. Next, I'll introduce silicon photonics technology and explain how we can make integrated photonic circuits. I'll then move on to describing some properties of graphene and why we are interested in using it for integrated photonics with some examples of the research we have been doing. I'll then finish up with an outlook and summarise the main points of my presentation. So this is a generic optical link that consists of an initial data stream in the electrical domain, which is typically driven by CMOS circuitry. This is passed to an optical transmitter, which converts the electrical signal into an optical signal, which uses a light source, typically a laser and a modulator. So the modulated uh, output signal is then transmitted over a communications channel, which can be many different media depending on the environment. And once the signal has arrived at the destination, it is converted back into an electrical signal by an optical receiver using a photo detector and some sort of amplifier. And we are interested in using optics because it enables high bandwidth and low power data transmission. And generally the most expensive part of the optical link is the electro optic conversion, which historically was always done with a discrete component, uh, which used exotic materials. So optical networks based on optical fibers have been around since the 1980s. Even though they were much more expensive than electrical cables, they were favored because of the high losses of electrical cables over long distances. So the massive growth shown in the figure has been fueled by the adoption of different technologies such as wavelength division multiplexing to send different streams of information in the same optical fiber at different wavelengths and by using high spectral efficiency coding that increases the density of the transmitted information by using more complex modulation formats for representing information. So instead of simply using a digital format with based on two levels, more levels could be used and other properties of the optical signal such as the phase could be exploited. But now to continue to push capacity beyond the limits of the single optical fiber, we need to move to using bundles of optical fiber or completely different fiber architectures with more cores. And these combined approaches with all these techniques has led to the current record of 10 petabits per second demonstrated in 2017. And these massive data rates put a heavy strain on the existing optical networks. And when it comes down to it, the limiting factor is power. So to make future long distance networks sustainable, low power optical transceivers are needed. So this figure shows that the transition from optical to electrical interconnect happens as distances get shorter. And typically short reach applications like board to board or chip to chip have stuck with electrical interconnect because the cost and complexity of optical systems is just too high to warrant replacing the existing electrical networks. However, as data rates move to terabit per second, the adoption of optical networks is moving to shorter and shorter length scales because of the high resistance and therefore losses of electrical networks at high frequencies. So for short reach area is more of a premium so optical networks would require low power and compact optical transceivers. So silicon photonics uses silicon waveguides to guide light on chip with the major benefit of being um, able to use the existing CMOS technology. So this means that we can make integrated photonic circuits with electrical and photonic components on the same wafer. And as shown in the pictures, the waveguides can be very small, which means that the circuits can be very compact. So it turns out that silicon is a good material for guiding light uh, at the wavelengths used for communications because its band gap means that it has low optical losses and it does not absorb a lot of light. But we'll see later that this is not particularly great if you want to modulate or detect the light. So pluggable optics has been made possible by silicon photonics. These are small pluggable optical transceivers that are used for rack to rack interconnect within a data center. And these are becoming very popular in data centers and last year Intel announced the latest pluggable transceiver, which showed 400 gigabit per second transmission. And ideally to reduce the power, the optics should be as close to the ASIC as possible. So one approach is to bring the optics on board. 
And this is a picture from IMEC that shows a silicon photonic integrated circuit die with a bonded 3.5 laser and an optical fiber array that couples light in and out of the photonic circuits. This can be taken even further with co-packaged optics where the silicon photonic chip is in the same packaging as the CPU. And even this year, Intel announced the first co-packaged switch that is capable of 12.8 terabits per second data transmission. So now moving to graphene. Graphene is a single sheet of carbon atoms that is arranged in a honeycomb structure and confined in the 2D plane. Each carbon atom is covalently bonded to the neighboring three carbon atoms and forms very strong sigma bonds that gives graphene its high mechanical strength. Graphene's conductivity comes from the out-of-plane pi bond that overlaps with the neighboring carbon atoms so that the electrons become delocalized and behave as a 2D electron gas. Uh, the in-plane confinement of carbon atoms leads to a linear band structure. And unlike silicon, graphene does not have a band gap and instead the valence band and the conduction band touch at the so-called Dirac point. In this schematic of undoped graphene, the filled energy states are shown in yellow and the Fermi level is at the Dirac point. But when we apply an electric field to graphene, the position of the Fermi level changes and we get a resistance curve that looks like the curve on the right. We see that the resistance is maximum when the Fermi level is at the Dirac point, and this is because the density of states shrinks so that there are very few carriers remaining. If we apply a positive voltage, the resistance drops and the Fermi level moves into the conduction band and graphene becomes n-doped with majority electron carriers. However, when we apply a negative voltage, we do still get the same decrease in resistance, but the Fermi level moves into the valence band and graphene becomes p-doped with majority hole carriers. And this ambipolarity and symmetry around the Dirac point is a direct result of the linear band structure. And importantly for high-speed optoelectric uh, applications, graphene has a very high mobility which can far ex exceed 100,000 at room temperature. So graphene's linear band structure also has a significant impact on its optical properties. Firstly, for undoped graphene, graphene shows broadband absorption where photons of any wavelength can be absorbed. This means that unlike other materials, graphene is not limited to a specific operating range. And it was also shown that graphene absorbs 2.3% of light, which is quite a lot when you consider that it's only one atom thick. So the second property that is useful is that the optical properties can be electrostatically controlled. So the figure on the right shows a plot of the optical conductivity of doped graphene for different photon energies, which is represented by the angular frequency omega. Each curve corresponds to a different voltage applied to graphene and therefore a different doping. And we see that for high energy photons that the conductivity is flat, which is the same as the undoped case because photons are being absorbed. However, after a certain point, the optical conductivity begins to drop because the photons do not have sufficient energy to excite an electron to the conduction band. And we see that the transition to the minimum absorption can be moved to different energies by just changing the doping of graphene and applying a voltage. So together, a high carrier mobility, wavelength independent absorption and electrostatically tunable optical properties make graphene very interesting for high speed integrated photonics. So there are different ways of encoded information into light. Here I've shown two examples where a binary data stream is encoded into the amplitude and phase of the optical signal. In the case of amplitude modulation, a zero is represented by a zero amplitude and a one is represented by amplitude A. And in the case of phase modulation, a one is 180 degrees out of phase with a zero. In this binary case, there are two symbols where one corresponds to bit zero and the other corresponds to bit one. So complex modulation formats use a combination of amplitude and phase modulation to increase the number of bits of information that can be represented for each symbol and therefore increase the capacity of transmitted information. And typically modulators use silicon, lithium niobate or 3.5 as the active optic, uh, optical material. And I've said before that silicon makes a very good waveguide material because it has low optical loss losses but it can be used for optical modulation by using doped silicon waveguides. However, the dopants severely increase absorption so that silicon-based modulators suffer from high optical losses that do not meet the low power requirements. Lithium niobate is the common material used in discrete modulator components and 3.5 materials show very efficient modulation, but both require complex wafer bonding and processing techniques that are not ideal for low cost integrated photonic circuits. So this is the schematic of the graphene modulator that we made. 
Starting with photonic circuits, we fabricated a double layer graphene stack on top of the waveguides. And this stack consists of two layers of graphene separated by gate dielectric, which in this case is aluminium oxide. The region where the two layers overlap forms a capacitor structure so that an applied voltage across the two layers generates a perpendicular electric field which changes the doping of both graphene layers. And we see that the electric field profile of the light propagating along the waveguide overlaps with the region where the graphene layers overlap each other. And this means that the changing optical properties of graphene will change the optical properties of the propagating light. So the figure on the right shows how the simulated refractive index shown in blue and the optical loss shown in orange of the propagating light change, changes with changing doping of graphene. So for low doping, we see that the optical loss is at its highest and remains flat, as we've seen before. And we see that as the doping increases, we see the expected transition to minimum optical loss when photons are no longer being absorbed. So this shows that graphene can be used as either an amplitude or phase modulator because of the induced change in optical losses and refractive index. Okay, so this is a close-up image of our actual fabricated graphene modulator. But because we want to detect the phase of the optical signal, we need to use a waveguide structure whose transmission depends on phase. So these structures use interference so that any difference in phase is translated into an interference pattern at the output. So here we have used a Max Zender interferometer made of wave waveguides which split the incoming light between two arms. If there is a phase difference between the two arms, the signals will interfere and produce an interference pattern when they are recombined. Now, if we put a graphene modulator on the arms, we can introduce an additional change of phase or optical loss, which will affect the output transmission pattern. So by monitoring the wavelength dependent transmitted power with varying voltage across one of the graphene modulators, which is shown on the right, we see that the interference pattern changes with applied voltage. So firstly, we see that as the voltage increases, the interference pattern shifts to longer wavelengths, which is a direct result of the induced change of phase by the graphene modulator. On the other hand, we see that the depth of fringes, known as the extinction ratio, is also increasing with increasing voltage, which is a direct result of the change in the optical loss by the graphene modulator. So by monitoring the shift of the interference pattern and the change in the extinction ratio, with applied voltage, we can extract the change of phase and loss that was induced by our modulator. And we found that our devices are very efficient and we only need millimeter length devices to induce a pi phase shift with one volt driving voltage. And this is an order of magnitude smaller than silicon or lithium niobate modulators, which would need centimeter long devices to induce the same phase shift with one volt. So now we'll move on to photodetectors, which typically use semiconductors to convert a stream of photons into a photocurrent. The photons will be absorbed if their energy is greater than the band gap, and then the generated electron hole pairs can be separated by an electric field to produce a photocurrent. The performance of photodetectors will be reduced due to carrier recombination before the carriers can be collected, or by dark current which adds to the photodetector noise. Due to silicon's band gap, new materials with a smaller band gap are needed to achieve photodetection in silicon photonics. And typically these are based on epitaxially grown germanium on silicon or bonded 3,5 wafers, which are not only costly and complex to integrate into silicon photonic circuits, but also have a limited operating range. So there are many different mechanisms in graphene for generating a photocurrent or photovoltage and the dominant photo detection mechanism will largely depend on the device design and the operating conditions. So the benefits of graphene for photo detection is that it is inherently broadband, which is not the case for germanium or 3.5, and that it should have a very high operating speed because of its high intrinsic carrier mobility. However, because it does have a band gap, it does suffer from high dark currents with an applied voltage because there is no barrier to stop photons from being absorbed. So we have chosen to design graphene photodetectors that use the photothermoelectric effect, or PTE, because it uses a temperature gradient with no applied bias to generate a photovoltage. So this means that we completely cut off the dark current and remove the need of a transimpedance amplifier that is usually required to turn the generated photocurrent into a voltage. So the schematic of our photodetector is shown on the left. In this case, we're using a single layer of graphene on top of a silicon nitride waveguide. 
Above the graphene, we have two metal gates called split gates, which are used to create a PN junction in the graphene channel. So these gates also concentrate the electric field within the centre of the graphene channel, as shown in the mode profile below, which boosts the efficiency of the photodetector because it increases the interaction between the graphene and the propagating light. So in operation, we measure the generated photovoltage from the two contacts on either side of the graphene channel as a function of gate voltage, which is shown on the right. And we see the typical six-fold pattern in polarity of the photovoltage, which is a fingerprint of the PTE. So we measured a 12.2 volts per watt responsivity, which is defined as the ratio of the photovoltage with the input power and a 42 gigahertz bandwidth. But importantly, we had no dark current because we do not need to apply a voltage across the graphene channel. So now that we've developed individual modulators and photodetectors, the challenge was to combine them into systems. However, due to COVID-19, we were not able to measure the performance or full functionality of either of the transmitter or receiver. So now I can just show you a few pictures of the graphene based transmitter and receiver that we did design and fabricate. So firstly, this is an image of our graphene transmitter that is made out of eight of our graphene modulators. And this is a picture of our graphene receiver that is made of eight graphene photodetectors. Both transmitter and receiver were designed for IQ modulation, which produces constellation diagrams like this example of 16 QAM that has 16 symbols where each symbol represents four bits of information. This type of modulation format is ideal for high capacity applications in long haul networks, but difficult to implement for short reach applications because the total device is not very compact and requires many drivers and light sources. And just for fun, I wanted to just show you what a measured constellation diagram actually looks like for 2048 QAM. So this brings me to the summary of my presentation and the outlook. Firstly, power efficiency, efficiency is key for terabit per second data transmission. And if data rates keep climbing as we anticipate, then low power interconnect solutions are necessary to process the vast amounts of data. Silicon photonics is a promising technology to produce integrated photonic circuits and make low cost and low power optical devices. And I hope that I have convinced you that graphene is a promising material that can provide a combined photo detection and modulation platform that can be integrated in the back end of line CMOS fabrication. But it is now an engineering problem to improve the growth and processing techniques so that we can realize the theoretical potential graphene is capable of. Thank you very much for listening and I welcome any questions you might have. Hello everyone. Let me first uh, thank uh, Hannah Watson uh, for her uh, very great, uh, very great presentation. Hannah is a final year PhD student and uh, at the Cambridge Graphene Center at the University of Cambridge. Her focus on research are graphene based uh, integrated photonics and its application for optical interconnect. Previously, she had a background in physics. And well, uh, if we are ready, we will start uh, uh, saying hi to Hannah first and, and asking her the questions that you have forward here. So thank you very much for the questions. So Hannah, uh, the first question, uh, reads like this. Uh, can you achieve bidirectional transmissions inside the same waveline? If yes, does the photodetector device generate some reflection in the waveline, in the waveguide? Sorry. Um, yes, so thanks for the question. Um, yes, the transmission inside uh, a silicon waveguide or, so, or another material does go both ways. And a large problem we have with graphene devices is actually reflections due to um, different impedances. So these photodetectors are very small, so they have a very small resistance. So if you're using, using equipment with a 50 ohm impedance, you get a huge reflection here. So you do, um, the performance is limited by that. So there's a few tip, uh, tricks you can do when you're measuring to do impedance matching, but um, reflections are always a problem in these sorts of devices because um, it reduces the amount of light which is actually at the devices. So we just want to keep everything as similar as possible. So you can get reflections from lots of different things as well. If you put more waveguide material on top of the waveguide in certain areas, um, then you'll get reflections or when you're splitting the light, all these different photonic components have some element of reflection in them. Thank you very much. 
The second question is, uh, is your team working on photonic switches generated from graphene? As uh, these are key for larger scale on-chip systems, good graphene, uh, graphene switches provide uh, benefits on that? So my team um, at the Cambridge Graphene Centre, we've been doing device level stuff at the moment. So the, in the last few slides, I showed you some pictures of the system level things and it's very early stages for our team. So I think in essence, because I don't have much experience with photonic switching, but I think um, these components are so graphene modulators and photo detectors can be used in these sort of um, devices. And because they're, they're more efficient than some other materials, you can have smaller versions of them. So I'm assuming for these sort of more on-chip, I think was mentioned in the question, they'd be very useful for that as well. Thank you very much. Uh, the next question reads, what are the physical limitations for its integration at mass production? So I'm assuming um, you, um, for mass production, you mean sort of CMOS processing. And um, I suppose the, it's always about integrating these new materials into CMOS is, is the problem. And graphene itself is fine, just being carbon, but it is grown. I didn't get to mention in the talk because of the time constraints, but it's actually grown on the copper foil substrates. Uh, and this can leave um, um, copper atom residues on the graphene. And this is a big problem for CMOS fabs. So it's sort of residues from the processing, which, which is the main problem for the uh, the integration in mass production. But the idea is that you can do all these things on the wafer scale. So you can grow graphene the size of a wafer. You can transfer it is, as this big size. I mean, it's obviously a bit more challenging than what I just said, but in essence, you could do it. So it's just the um, places like IMAC, IMAC and Extron in Cambridge, they're actually working on these sort of industri more industrial scale tools for large area transfer and and growth of these materials. So there is there needs to be some development into this, but um, companies are looking into it. Thank you very much. And very closely related to this uh, previous question, uh, what are the physical, uh, oh, sorry, this was the previous one. Uh, is there anything non-standard right now uh, that it is limiting this? I assume that this was uh, to be customer ready in the next, let's say, 10 years, for example. So from this IMEC development until final product, what do you think that the, it is going to take? So everyone always asks me about, I mean, a lot of people are aware of this hype curve with graphene. It was in the media a long, like for a long time now. It's been, everyone's been talking about it and not many people have seen it in these sort of applications they've seen it's come out as like a tennis racket I think you can have a snowboard but um, these sort of more complex uh, optoelectronic things aren't on the market yet but mainly because it's the um, this integration into CMOS um, because there's nothing inhibitly like, limiting them being integrated it's more just it's a new process so the way you would transfer graphene from its growth substrate onto the photonic substrate is you have to um, etch away the, um, the copper underneath and you essentially fish out the graphene. So that works well in a lab. It's very easy for me to just go around and just have a little play and make these devices. But um, it's, yeah, it's just that, that extra step just to make it more mature so that the yield is maintained because um, in single devices, that's, if yield is a bit poor, that, that's okay. But if you're doing systems like the ones I mentioned at the end with eight devices, as soon as a few of them, if the yield is, um, sorry, if the uniformity is not high enough, then the yield sort of just goes out the window. So um, that's a, it's these maturities that graphing needs to develop in order to, for it to actually make it into the market. But the project I've been working on with that transmitter and the receiver, they're aiming to have a sort of fully packaged device um, and in, in a year, a year or two, I think there's another another part of this project. So there are people really trying, but it's just it'll take a few more years. Thank you very much. The next question reads, is it possible to create a wavelength division multiplexer a transceiver using graphene given its uh, broadband nature? Uh, yes, it definitely is. So um, with the modulators anyway, like so graphene can absorb if it's not doped uh, pretty, at a very wide uh, wavelength spectrum. 
But as soon as you start putting a, an electric field across it and you start doping it, this transition to the sort of transparency part when the, the interband transitions are blocked, it, it that point moves to different um, wavelengths. I mean, you have to apply a bigger field for different wavelengths. So you can in theory do it, but then the voltages you would need to, to gate the graphing modulator far enough to get to that point might be quite impractical. But you can definitely do wavelength division multiplexing with graphene. I've, um, I've made and measured a four channel one. So in that case, the spacing of the different wavelength channels is, I mean, I can't, I think we're talking about like tens of nanometers or something like that, um, the spacing. So we don't, the problem I was mentioned before doesn't really apply here because they're so close together. And it's mainly the, the design of the ring resonators, which you put the graphene on, which is determining your different operating wavelengths. But yes, graphene can be used. I think it's from the visible all the way up to the um, mid infrared. Um, so for, for that's more compelling for the photo detectors because they don't need to have this, um, this powerly blocking this, um, this point when you have the dope graphene for the modulators. So, and that's another reason why graphene is interesting for this, even though it's taking its time, but you can't get this in a lot of other materials. So that, that's why it's really compelling. Thank you very much. And the next question we have, as a follow-up on the switching, what do you consider to be the main limitation on graphene-based based NZI switches? So the, um, the MZI switches is, is what I showed in the presentation. So that's using this math sender interferometer when you split the signal into two arms and then they interfere again. And um, they're a very um, attractive component for long distance communication because you can do these really jazzy, fancy format, uh, modulation formats that I mentioned in the presentation. And I mean, we've shown that they work and we've shown that you can get to this low loss regime. Um, but uh, the problem is sort of the optical losses. So when you do this big transfer of graphene onto the device, you should be able to remove it with an oxygen plasma very, very easily. But the, if you have any problems with your transfer and sort of the graphene starts rolling up, then you can't really remove these things in the same way. You'd have to physically um, bombard them off, which is not good for the rest of the device. So at the moment, we need to really optimize the optical losses. So any residues, which remain on the graphene can uh, affect the performance. And at the moment, it, if you compare it to other technologies like lithium niobate or 3.5, we're losing on that front. So we're, we have shown efficiency. We've shown um, uh, both as modulators and photo detectors. But then when you do the actual figure of merit characterization, their losses are so much lower that, um, that graphene is not there yet. But in theory, in all the simulations, it can be. So it's, it's just the... Uh, streamlining now the processing so that we can limit any damage done to graphene during any of the fabrication. Okay. Uh, for the next question, on the interfering system that you have shown, what parameters control this inter interference? I assume that this was referring to generate a, a different response. Mm -hmm. So, um, the, the interference in these math sender interferometers uh, is, it occurs when you, you split the incoming signal into two arms. So, and then it's what happens in either of the two arms which causes the interference pattern. So if they were the same material and the same length, you actually wouldn't see an interference pattern at the end because they're just the same wave. But by putting a modulator on each of the arms that we've done, you can actually control the, um, the change of phase experienced on each, each arm uh, and also the absorption in each arm. So by changing the phase, you'll see that the interference pattern shifts because we're, we're changing the, um, the phase of one of the arms. So then, so that's how we measure it. And then if we're introducing a change in absorption, we'll actually see uh, a change in the depth of the interference fringes because if, for example, on one arm, you completely absorbed the light, then, um, you will see no interference pattern again because you only have one wave coming out the other end. So these are all things that we can monitor on the transmission to extract the parameters of our device. But there's also other things so that the photonic component itself, so with no graphene on it, um, the splitting ratio has a big effect on the interference pattern because if usually it's 50-50 splitting, but it can't always guarantee that. So if it's 49-51, 
that will also affect affect it. And usually you would just compensate for these sort of things with um, the active component on the arms. Thank you. Well, the next question, uh, it uh, regards the, the area. Uh, what is the total area or relative against other communication elements uh, that it's going to, to consume in the, in the chip? Oh, uh, this one, I have not much experience in the system level things yet, because um, so far I've only just looked at the graphene components. Um, and especially it depends if you're looking at um, short distance or long distance communications, I think that the sizes are very different. So in, in, long, in long distance, a lot of it is discrete components still. Um, and the benefit here is that by using an integrated silicon photonic solution is that you can do fancier things than with uh, these discrete components. Um, and then on the smaller, smaller length scales, everything is, you want it as small as possible. So um, I, I think, so the, the transmitter and the receiver that I did show, they're quite large um, as it goes um, for the, the area that the device takes up because it is made of this nested Mathsender structure. So this is why it's not, also, it's not attractive either for short, short distance applications because it just takes up so much, and it, uh, so much room. So what um, they would typically use ring resonators or something like this for the shorter ones because they're much more compact. I think the rings can be like tens of microns in diameter and then you can really, really com uh, compress these things. Thank you. We have one final question. I would like to also, uh, before going into this one, uh, remember that the, you can write the, the questions and we can come and read them again. And that after this, uh, this session, we have the poster sessions at upcoming. So let's go for this uh, final question. What final figures or energy benefit numbers would you think that these optical communication systems would provide? So actual numbers, uh, I'm quite embarrassed I have none on hand, but I think um, it's not always just about that it's, it's more energy efficient. I think we're getting to the point when it's just going to be very too impractical to continue with the current, the current technology. So I have had discussions with, uh, with my team about or why can't you just carry on just doing binary formats? I mean, why can't you just have a million channels? And then it always, you could stick with this, but then if you have a million channels, you need a million drivers. And then the energy consumption of all these channels just goes through the roof. And you would need to have that many channels if you stay on binary formats, because you can't, just cannot send more information down, down the pipe. So we want to have these fatter pipes, otherwise we, it's just, we won't be able to do it. And then the, the, the losses from the electrical and interconnect is another real like hurdle that we're coming to. Like even in the, in the data in the data centers with these pluggable transceivers, I mean it's not so far that distance within the switch from the front plate to the like the, the ASIC, but even that distance is it's worth having this new co-packaged optics switch because it's just going to become impossible to do terabit per second sort of data rate transmission with the existing technology. So yeah, I, I can't give you a number of what of how much energy you'll save if you switch to optical, but I think it's more of a case that something has to change if we're going to keep up with this. And so that, that that's more the main point. I see. Thank you very much. So, well, uh, again, I would like to thank you for the talk and for being here to to answer these questions. Uh, and I would like to remain the, to remember the audience that they can go now to to see the the posters on the, the short the docs here. Right. Thank you very much, everyone. Thanks, Fernando. Thanks, Hannah.